seated. I just wanted to take the bench before the jury got here to let the sides know that we will not need to break early after all. We'll just go to 445 as we have been going. So with that, let's... Uh, General, yes. Two things. One, I have to find my glasses before we do anything, and I don't okay. know where I left them, but I'll go find them. Um, oh, thank you. Problem with losing your glasses is you can't see. Sure. Um, the other thing is, and I just thought it'd be easier to do it now rather than when a jury lead the jury back out. One of the exhibits that I'm going to want to talk to my client about on the redirect is um, what's the exhibit number? Are you talking about that text thread? Susan, yeah. It's 212.4. Oh, I would. Can, can, I would like to show the court right now exhibit defense exhibit 212.4. Okay. Which is a text from Dan Brophy to Nancy Brophy asking her whether she's tackling Susan's room with, a, I think, with abandon. Um, counsel had asked Ms. Brophy on cross examination whether, why she hadn't cleaned up, why they hadn't cleaned up the house before Dan died. And so I want to talk to her about this texted question because it sets the time in which she's actually trying to clean out Susan's room, which is the second bedroom downstairs, which happened on March 4th of 2018. Okay, I'm, I'm trying to follow. Uh, there were some questions about whether or not they had cleaned up to prepare to sell the house <laughs> before his death. What is the relevance of this? The relevance is this. He's asking Ms. Brophy whether she's attacking Susan's room with reckless abandon. And the date of this text message is March 4th, 2018, at about 1230 in, in the afternoon. Okay, um, so your argument is that it's rebutting a contention that they weren't doing anything to prepare for. Okay. Yes, and I, I want to show that to my client and ask her what she was doing in Susan's room. Um, Okay. On March I, I think I'm, I think I'm following now. Yeah. Okay. And, and does the state? What's the state's position? Well, we we do have a relevancy objection and a hearsay objection, but also if Dan asking, I mean, Miss Brophy could certainly say on on redirect or she can clarify on cross if she wants that they were in fact getting ready to sell the house, and one of the things they were doing was cleaning up that room. What Dan's asking about attacking the room without any context whatsoever, um, what does that have to do with Ms. Brophy's testimony? Yeah, All right. I, I think it's the question which isn't hearsay because it's a question. But it's it's tethered to this specific time and date. I, I understand, and I, you know, she'll answer the question which will provide the context. Uh, so I, I will allow, I will allow this. Are you asking to admit this or to show it to her? I want to show. It, I, I want to, but I, I, I want that. I think that the date and time of this question is admissible to corroborate Ms. Brophy's testimony that yes, they were cleaning out the house before, and one of the first things she did was to clean out Susan's room, which was the second bedroom downstairs, and it, this is also the room that Jack Brophy had declared was filled with. Dan, I think it was Dan Brophy's, was it debris? It was just Dan debris, Dan debris, Dan debris. Um, so he had already referenced that, and I, will, I want my client to talk about what was going on months before Dan died. So, but I think that the date stamp on this particular uh, text message is relevant. It came off of Dan's phone. The question that he's asking is not hearsay because it's a question, and I want to be able to corroborate and bolster Ms. Brophy's testimony regarding what was happening in that time frame. All right, did you want to add anything more, Mr. Overstreet? Well, first of all, the idea that a question can't be hearsay is not true. Um, questions can be hearsay. In fact, it is offered for the truth of the matter asserted that they were cleaning the room. That's what the question is. And that's what they're offering it for, so therefore it is hearsay. All right, so anything more? All right. I would agree that questions can be hearsay. I'm not sure that this one is, but in any event, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna allow this 
And I, I don't know that this particular question is hearsay because if you just read it by itself, I don't know if it's a statement really of anything. I, I don't even know if one could even understand what it means uh, without the context that your client will provide. So I'll, I'll allow the question and the admission of this text. Thank you, Your Honor. Now I get out of my glasses. Okay, that was the second thing. Um, are we ready, sir? Yeah. Okay, we'll go off record and meet with the You, since I have no idea, sort of preparing for the inevitable and concerns about the length of the trial, uh, I'm not going to hold anyone to this, but how much longer do you think cross-examination is, roughly, roughly? Uh, it's really hard to say, Your Honor, okay. uh, because based on the answers okay. and the length of the answers, so I, I can't really say. All right. Uh, let me ask this then. For the other witnesses that are lined up for defense, which I, I think there were four or five, I don't remember precisely, do you have a rough ballpark of how long you think those other witnesses will take? Well, I'm known for being overly optimistic about <laughs> things like this. I was going to say they really shouldn't run more than about a half an hour each, but that's not. Okay, that gives me some idea. All right, okay. Let's uh, let's bring the jury back. Okay, um, we'll go off record and meet tomorrow.
And Mrs. Brophy, if we can have you retake the stand. Yes. You can't see that. I can't see it. So let me know when, when you're ready, okay? I'm ready. I want to talk to you about uh, your familiarity with the Oregon Culinary Institute. Okay. Um, and I asked you if you could see States Exhibit 1. Uh, and that's what you were saying. Yes, you, you can see that okay? Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, does that look familiar to you? Yes, it does. Um, how many times would you say you visited the Oregon Culinary Institute? Um, hundreds. Um, have you been to m most areas of the building? I have been. And before it was ORCI, it was a division of Western Culinary. So... I have been there many times. Is that where you, is that, that's not the building that you went to culinary school? Though, no, correct? it's not. Okay. Um, but when it was Western Culinary, um, it, you, you had familiarity with it then? Mm-hmm. Okay. And then when it became the Oregon Culinary Institute, of course, Dan worked there. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you think you've been there hundreds of times? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, is there any area that you hadn't, haven't ever been in? Uh, it, you can use the pointer there if you'd like. All right. This area, it's not that I don't know that classroom. It's that I've really never been in there. And this little closet area in here, I've never been in there. Uh, this became a classroom later, uh, but uh, I've certainly been in it when it was an empty space. Um, other than that, I would say no. Okay. When you would come down to the Culinary Institute, <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, well, there's been some testimony that you used to come to the restaurant quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, where would you generally park and where would you go in? Uh, you can have an hour's parking out in front, and uh, but I never parked in the student parking lot. It was too crowded. Uh, so you either parked in the hour parking lot or across the street in front of Starbucks in that area. Okay. You would go in this entrance down here, this entrance down here. Uh, and then sit in the dining room. Okay. And then when you came down to say bring Dan something or um, just come to visit or whatever, where would you generally park and go in then? A lot of times I wouldn't park at all. A lot of times Dan would leave the vehicle unlocked for me. I would find where he'd parked. I'd put stuff on a seat. I'd lock his car. I would get back in and go. Other times, Dan would meet me with a cup of coffee because he knows a good bribe, and uh, he would give me the coffee. I'd give him whatever he'd gotten at, ha at the house, and I would not go in. On the few occasions that I went in, I would come in to student interest because that was the one that was unlocked. Okay. Now, you said that you visited the Culinary Institute a couple weeks prior to Dan's death, mm -hmm. also on a Saturday, mm -hmm. about 7.30 in the morning. It could have been. If cell site location information said that was 7.30, would you agree with that? I probably would, yeah. Okay. You said that day you were meeting a client and you decided to stop there to use the restroom. Right. And you said that Dan uh, had to let you in. Yes. Which door was that? Dan would have let me in the uh, staff entrance, which is uh, down at the end of, of that strip. That 17th uh, right. side door. Right. And did you park on the street? Yes. And he let you in that door. Yes. You said you went to the restroom. Yes. Which restrooms did you go to? I have no idea. Did you go to the ones in that main hallway or did you have to go somewhere else? Well, the restrooms are here right. and here. So I went to one of them. I have no idea which restroom I went to. When you were using the restroom, where did Dan go? He did whatever he does, you know. Uh, he was doing what his routine was or whatever. What did you see him doing when you were in there? Well, I was in the restroom. I didn't see him doing anything. Not while you're in the restroom, when you're in the building. 
Uh, I came out of the restroom. He came out of one of the classrooms. He walked me to the to the door, and I left. I, you know, there wasn't. We didn't have social hour. He was working. I was bar in the bathroom. I had things to do. He had things to do. What it, were the What were the names of the other people that were there? I didn't see anybody there, but uh, that didn't mean people weren't there. Uh, I would have said Yadu was there, and I probably would have said the other instructor was there. But you didn't see or hear anyone, did you? Not that I recall. And that was on May 17th? I'm not sure. If the cell site location information put you at the school at 7.30 on May 17th, would you agree with that? I'm not sure. Uh, and the reason why I'm not sure is, uh, I'm just going to say I'm not sure. You agreed that it was two to three weeks prior? Mm -hmm. Something like that. Okay. And you didn't go another time? No. Okay. So, um, being familiar with this building, you knew there were no cameras in the building, right? You know, that just never came up in the conversation. I wouldn't have told you if there were cameras in the building or not. You don't recall telling anybody that you knew there were no cameras in the building? I may have said that because I may have known more five years ago than I know more now. Huh? Okay. That I know there was no cameras now because of all this, all this, th all these things that have happened. I can't really tell you, although I may, may have known it, whether there were cameras before that. I just don't remember if I knew that before. What about outside the building? Did you see any cameras? Once again, I wasn't looking. What about over at, at BMW? Or yeah, what was BMW was prior to the property room? Did you see any cameras over there? Not looking. I, I wasn't paying enough attention to have told you that. Did you see any cameras when in any of the visits that you came down to the Oregon Culinary Institute? Couldn't tell you. When did you find out about Mark's death? I can't tell you the exact time, but I can tell you the day. And it was, uh, Mark died on uh, June 22nd. What were you doing when you got that call? Uh, I can't even tell you if it was Susan or Holly who called me. I talked to both of them, and I don't know who told me that. But uh, uh, Sarah not Susan or Holly, Sarah or Holly, uh, Sarah and I, Sarah said, can I come over? And I said, sure. But whatever I was doing, it was probably wandering around in a bog anyway. So I have no idea what I was doing. So did you find out on a phone call or? Is it better if I sit back a little? Um, did I, I guess I found out on a phone call. What about Ed? What were you doing? Uh, I think Cousin Janet was there when we found out about Ed. Uh, I, uh, we both knew he was in bad health, but, uh, I think Cousin Janet, uh, may have gotten the text or a phone call or something <laughs> from him, so we, we knew. And you've seen all the video of you driving around downtown at this point, right? Yes. You've seen the still photographs from that mm -hmm. and you, you testified on direct that it looked like you looked like your van mm -hmm. didn't quite say you do agree that that is you at this point right you know I do I do but I would say that it took me a while to get to that stage but as you sit here today, you agree that it is you driving that van that morning. Yes, but I also think that uh, only because of the date stamp can I tell on the things can I tell you it was that morning. Right. You're not challenging that. You're agreeing that that is you. We have more things to challenge than me driving around in this case. You would agree that you're driving around and at the in front of the culinary institute at the exact time that Dan is being murdered. 
I no, actually, I don't agree with that. I was driving around for a full hour before Dan got murdered. I was down there before Dan ever got to school. I had, was driving around riding for a full hour. I was only in that vicinity for six minutes, and I don't know that Dan was uh, murdered in that six minutes. Uh, you know, we agree that he we agree that he was murdered in that time frame, but in terms of when he arrived and shortly thereafter, but in whether it's not in that six minutes or not, I don't know. I'm sorry, did you just say that you were driving around riding? Yes, that's what I was doing, was driving around riding. I, I testified to that yesterday, that I would find a place to park and I'd jot down ideas. I thought you didn't know that you were driving. Yesterday, what I testified for was that when I was sitting in there, I could remember being in the... Uh, being in the parking lot riding. Didn't I say that yesterday? No. No. Okay. So let, let's let's go back over. This. Okay, let's go back. I'm gonna pause the two of you. So this is Brophy, don't ask questions. Mr. Overstreet, don't answer questions. <laughs> Sorry. So yesterday mm -hmm. you stated that you remembered a time mm -hmm. being in that area. Mm -hmm and you were riding, uh -huh. there was a white van, uh -huh. there was a man going back and forth between the white van and some other location, you uh -huh. assumed that he was working on the van, it was distracting to you, and that you decided to leave. Do you remember that? Uh -huh. is, that, is, that is that accurate? Yeah. Okay. Your attorney then asked you if that was on June 2nd. And I said I did not know. Right. So if you do not know, you uh -huh. have no memory, of driving around downtown on the morning of June 2nd, uh -huh. how can you sit here today and say that I was driving around writing? Because if I was down there, that's what I was doing. And you're right, I stand corrected that I should have answered the question differently and said, I don't know. But I do know based upon the timestamps that I was down there an hour before Dan died. And that I was only down there for six minutes or less from the time that he signed into the building right. until you see me again leaving the area. Right. That six minutes, mm -hmm. you just happened to be in front of the Culinary Institute during that time. No, I wasn't. Did you see the video where you can see your van turning off of 17th onto Jefferson at 7.28 a.m.? I, I did see that, but that doesn't mean I was in front of the, the Culinary Institute. That means I would have come up from another street to have gotten there. But you're not seen on any other cameras until that moment. Ah, uh, but as you all testified, if there's a train, you can't see when people cross Madison. So I could have been, and what I actually think I was, if this is having thought about it for a while, is in another parking lot off Madison at that point. So I can say at 728, I definitely turned the van and was driving uh, there, and we all saw it, but I have no idea, and I know I wasn't parked in front of the building, so what I would have been is riding someplace else and coming around. Now, I'm doing this based upon putting stuff back together, not based upon actual memory. Right, you said you know that you wouldn't have been parked in front of the building, but how would you know that? Because I would have gone inside, because I would have said, to, hi, Dan, how are you? Because... Um, uh, when Dan came out of the building, he would have said, hey, Nancy, how are you? You know, this is we're not foreigners. We know each other. How do you know you didn't go in the building? I know I didn't go in the building because I didn't kill Dan. You know, I know that for a fact. If you have no memory, how do you know you didn't go in the building? You know, I'm reconstructing this, but I'm reconstructing this based upon what I know in my heart. And what I know in my heart is the reason why I have no memory is because I was stunned by the fact Dan was dead. And I wouldn't have been stunned if I'd been in the building and shot him. I didn't suggest that you did go in to shoot him. What I'm suggesting and asking okay. is did you just go in the building? And how would you know if you didn't? I agree that... Uh, but he wasn't part of my focus that morning. My focus was on my story, getting it out and getting it done, you know. Uh, and Dan is at work. 
you know, you don't, your wife doesn't drop in to see you at work just because she's driving by. You know, she assumes you're working. I assume Dan is working. You did it two weeks prior. I did it for a specific purpose, which was to go to the bathroom. Right. So, Miss Brophy, would you agree that it's possible that you went into the OCI on the morning of June 2nd to no. use the bathroom? No, I wouldn't. It's impossible. I would say it was impossible. Even though you have no memory of it. Even though I have no memory of it. Where did you normally go to get Starbucks? It depended on where I was going that morning. Uh, if I was going to McMinnville, there's a Starbucks uh, as I drive down 217 that I can hop off on. Uh, if I was going to uh, uh, Oregon City, uh, Oregon City, Oregon City, uh, if I was going to Oregon City, what I actually did was I didn't stop for Starbucks because there was a Starbucks in the Fred Myers where I was going, <laughs> so I would have gone there. Uh, if I was at home, uh, there's a Starbucks on Beaverton Hillsdale Highway right by Jesuit High School. There's a Starbucks on Hall where it intersects with um, um, right across from the Beaverton Mall. Those are the two I tend to go to occasionally, occasionally. But if I have time and I'm going to sit there and write, then I usually go to the one at 17th and um, 17th and Canyon, which is just the other side. Uh, other side of uh, 26. Right. Oh uh, no, the other side of or, 217. Sorry, 217. That's what. Mm -hmm. I'm, um, other side of 217 from your from your house. Mm -hmm. Okay, so have you taken a look at your bank records? I have not. In preparation for this trial, you haven't seen your bank records? Uh, well, I saw them months and months ago. Okay. Uh, and you've heard testimony that you go to Starbucks quite a bit. I do. Um, I think somebody said almost $1,000 in a year or something like that. Yeah, I was shocked by that figure, too. <laughs> I think we all would be. Um, but there's no charge for Starbucks on the morning of June 2nd. Yes, but if you go through my bank records, you will see there's no charge for Starbucks a lot of days when I know that I had coffee. You know, if I had cash, I could have paid cash. Keep in mind that I don't have my purse with me because I'm not carrying a purse. I'm not wearing a bra, so I don't have uh, a credit card with me. I don't have uh, my phone with me, so I would have had cash and just given it to them. It makes more sense that you'd have cash over a card? It makes more sense if I don't have a bra that I don't have a card with me. And you do agree you left your phone at home that morning? I agree I wasn't wearing a bra, so my phone wouldn't have been in my bra. All right. So you're, just this day is the day that you paid cash at Starbucks? I pay cash at Starbucks a fair amount. Okay. So in the morning, if Dan doesn't bring you coffee, it would be normal for you to get up, not fully get dressed, run to Starbucks, use cash, use a card, who cares, right? Go back home and and write. Mm -hmm. That was normal. That would be a normal morning okay. on a day when I wasn't committed to doing something else. Right. But on June 2nd, mm -hmm. now you're saying that morning you got up. Well, let's, let's, let's take a step back. The night before, okay. your testimony was that you went to sleep late, or went to bed late, mm -hmm. and when you went to bed, you went up to that attic bedroom, Yes. and Dan was already in bed, Yes. and he was asleep, Yes. and the reason you went to bed late was because of a leak? Is that, no. is that the reason you went to bed late, or it just happened to be? No, I frequently went to bed much later than Dan. I Dan see. Dan went to bed early because he got up early. Okay. What time did he go to bed that night? I don't know. Okay. What time did you go to bed? I don't know that. Well, you said it was late. <coughs> what's, what's your reference point? Well, it was later than Dan. My reference point was that there was water on the floor. Okay. And the re water on the floor, I was trying to clean it up enough that, uh, you know, we didn't step in it in the middle of the night and didn't make it worse. And wh which sink are you talking about? The sink in the bathroom upstairs. So my bedroom is long and narrow. And right off of my bedroom to the left is a bathroom. 
And as I stepped in there, I could, we go from carpeting to sheet goods and I could feel the water under my feet. Uh, I think it was maybe just a little confusing. There was some testimony about something, some a problem with the kitchen sink. But you're not talking about the kitchen sink. No, and I thought that was not. Uh, I thought it was confusing, but I also thought at that point I was probably being making a point rather than pointing to the right sink, just pointing to a sink in general. Okay, fair enough. I just want to make sure we're talking about the right sink. Right. I, I, just, I just wasn't clear on that. So you're talking about the sink with the leak that was a right. concern on June 1st. Mm -hmm. was in the bathroom upstairs. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you kind of clean it up. Mm -hmm. You go to bed late. Mm -hmm. It sounds like maybe you woke up at some point in the night. I wake up every night in the middle okay. of the night. Do you have a specific recollection of waking up in the middle of the night? No. Nope. Okay. Um, and by that, you mean like you have to use the restroom or something? Or, you know, I really don't sleep very well at all. And I particularly don't sleep when I'm wound up. And when I'm working on a story, I'm wound up. So I'm just not a great sleeper anyway anymore. So when you wake up, was Dan already up? Yes, Dan was standing over the sink in the bathroom. And what was he doing? He was, he said, why are, why do we have all these towels in the sink? And so that was what we talked about was the fact that I think there's a leak and I had built underneath, but I couldn't feel it. You know, on the, whatever that long pipe's called that, uh, and, uh, and, uh, he said, well, I'll get something, uh, he said, I'll get something, or maybe I know he got something because I saw it. I'm not sure which way this is the truth here. Uh, but I, when I dealt with it later, there was a white bucket underneath. But the, I, the last thing I saw him doing was taking the wet towels down the stairs. That's the last time you saw him? Mm hmm Talked about a leak. He walked downstairs with some wet towels. Mm hmm You stayed in bed. Mm hmm Oh, no. This is where I got up and threw on a minimum amount of clothes and uh, ran to get coffee. I thought your testimony was you don't remember going to get coffee. I don't remember going to get coffee, but I do remember throwing on some clothes and uh, leaving the house. That wasn't your testimony yesterday. That I didn't throw on clothes and leave the you house? You got dressed, but you said you didn't have any recollection of leaving to go get coffee. Well, I think we're splitting hairs here. I don't remember getting coffee. I agree to disagree on that, but okay. Go okay. Ahead. Which is it, Ms. Brophy? Do you remember going to get coffee or did I do not remember getting coffee. I remember putting on clothes and heading downstairs. That's almost always a prelude to I'm going to get coffee. And Dan was already gone by the time you got downstairs? Oh, no. Dan was. Dan would have been there for uh, quite a bit longer. I was expecting to get coffee and be back before he was out of the shower and dressed and everything else, you know. Did you see him? No, he's in the basement. He took the wet towels down. So he's still there, but you didn't see him. That he's still there. So now you remember, you went downstairs, you got dressed, you went downstairs. Okay, and, and I have a there. real problem with this, and I have to apologize to you because what I do is I reconstruct based upon what I know would have happened, not what actually happened. So allow me to apologize for the fact that I am misleading you here, and that was not intentional. What I would tell you is I don't remember running into Dan. But if I would have, I think I would have remembered it. Uh, he's downstairs, I'm assuming, dealing with the, uh, the towels. I'm assuming that most of the mornings I'm right back in bed before he ever leaves. Okay, so what time did you leave? I have no idea. What time did you get back? I have no idea. What I know is the last time somebody saw me was I was in a video at 7.28. Right. So that morning you wake up, you mm -hmm. get dressed, you go downstairs, you leave, mm -hmm. you don't have any recollection as to where you went. No. And you don't know how long you were gone. I know from, from no, your, no. okay. Your memory. Memory, no. You have no idea how long you were gone. No, I have none. Uh, you know now that your phone was not with you. Yes. 
when you got back, was Dan still there? No. And, but I couldn't even tell you, wait, once again, I'm filling in for links. I don't know that Dan was there or not there. What I remember is that I was sitting in bed writing when Maxine called. There's a huge little right. blank in there. I know you jumped ahead with your lawyer. I'm not, we're going to go slower. Okay. So you assume you go get coffee. Mm-hmm. Get home. You don't know if Dan's still there or not. I don't remember if Dan's still there or don't not. Don't remember. You do remember at some point you're back in bed. Yes, because Maxine called and I was in bed writing. And what time was that? I don't remember that either. Maxine called, what, 9.30, 10 o'clock, somewhere in there? Sure. You remember that? I remember Maxine calling. You remember what she told you? I do. You remember how you responded? Yes. And then you remember uh, calling Dan? Yes. You remember trying to text Dan? Yes. You remember him not answering or responding to your text? I do. You then called Maxine Borgerding back. Right. You had a, you remember that conversation? Right. You got the phone with her. You called Karen Brophy. Right. You remember that conversation? I do. You remember after that that you got dressed? Yes. Well, yes. Yes. You got your phone. Got grabbed all my stuff. Got your stuff. Went downtown. Mm -hmm. Drove downtown. Mm -hmm. And when you drove downtown, did you take the normal way that you would drive when you were going to the Culinary Institute? I'm going to say that technically, I don't really remember, but based on bond habit, I would have bet money on it. Okay. So the same road that we see you coming in on on Jefferson mm -hmm. earlier in the morning, that's the route that you most likely would have taken. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when you came in, when you get to that roundabout, did you go down Columbia and turn on 17th? Yes. And I parked at Potluck in the Park. I'm not trying to trick you here. I want to show you a map. <clears throat> uh, you was part of State's Exhibit 95. I talked about the roundabout. Mm -hmm. When you came in here, did you come down to 17 and park on this corner right here? I didn't park on the corner. Or I parked, parked in here. Right, right in there. Yes. There's like a few spots there. Well, there's a delivery driveway. And I don't think they think there's spots. I, sure. think, I just created a spot. So you didn't come in, drive around Lincoln, and come up Jefferson, right? If we're talking about, I if we're talking about after Maxine called. I don't know what else did you go down there another time? Well, the video shows I'm down there another time. We're to the point in the morning where you talked to Maxine, you talked to Ms. Right, Brady. right, and so I would have gone exactly the way you showed and parked and park look in the park. So you came down here, turned on 17, parked somewhere in here. Right. At park, 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 park. Right. Okay. And then where did you walk to from there? Can I use the pointer? Yes, please. All right. So there was police tape. Sorry. There was a police tape that ran from this corner right here across the street so that you could not uh, turn either onto 17th or continue on. Right in the middle of the street was a police car. And I walked from here to the police car. Okay. And you said you interacted with a police officer at that point? Yes. A male police officer? Yes. And he directed you to go somewhere? I said, I'm Nancy Brophy. And he said, wait here. And he said, I want you to wait over there by that building, which that building was the corner of directly opposite of, of OCI. Okay. And uh, I went, stood over there. And uh, he brought other officers. Okay. Is that when uh, Officer Wells came and gave you a hug? When Officer Wells gave me a hug, we had walked from the corner. I had gone around the corner and come up uh, that 17th. And so we were probably, we were frankly, right in about where the AB is on this sign. Uh -huh. And uh, they had said, we want you to stand back over here. 
so that you're out of the range of the camera from the press. And I said, okay, and I'm crying. And that's when Officer Wills gave me a hug. Okay. And did she tell you anything? She told me she would like to be married to a chef. <coughs> okay. Did she tell you anything else? Not that I can recall. Okay. And did you speak with uh, the TIPS volunteer before you went into the van or after? I did not speak with them before. Okay. And she, I was in the van and they escorted her in. Do you recall seeing uh, Brian Wilkie and... Yes. Okay. Where was he? They... They were across Madison, and there was uh, Brian Wilkie, and uh, I know Woody Bailey was with him. There were two or three other people who were kind of all standing together over here. And you recall when the detectives walked up to you and said they wanted to speak with you in the van? It was in that period of time. And you remember getting in the van? Yes. You remember where the detectives sat? Yes. You remember having a conversation that was recorded with them? Yes. You, uh, you don't necessarily remember all the conversation? I would tell you it's funny, but I've heard that tape enough that I can tell you what, uh, what was on the tape. Was there anything inaccurate that you were reporting to the police? Not intentionally. Not what I asked. When the police said to me, where were you this morning? I told them where I was. And I told them where I was based upon the fact that when Maxine called me, that's where I was. In fact, what you told the police were you were in bed. Okay. You woke up when Dan came upstairs. Yes. That he came upstairs to take a shower. Yes. That after he got out of the shower, you two discussed the leak. I told him after the shower. I discussed well, maybe. The I don't know that you specified exactly when, but. Well, we're on veracity here, so we need to be accurate. Well, you tell me. When I don't think I told him it was after the shower. Okay. Was it before? I did. I think my memory is that I don't remember if he'd taken a shower or not. That's okay. why I was surprised you said that. Okay. But you told the police that. You could have been. Well, you said you heard the tape. I heard the tape. Okay. You told them that you took a shower. Sorry, that Mr. Brophy took a shower. I think I told him he came upstairs to take a shower. I don't think I told him he took a shower. You said that after the shower, he got dressed and left. Do you remember that? No, but I may have said it. And you said that he left at 7.05 to 7.10-ish. Do you remember that? <clears throat> yes, but that was based upon when he always left. Okay. But you just testified to something completely different. Here's the thing is that, no, I, I'm still on the same thing. I testified to the fact that I was trying to help the police so that they had an idea of what Dan did in the morning. I didn't think this whole thing had a damn thing to do with me. I thought it had to do with uh, uh, what was Dan doing? What can you do? To, what can you tell us to help us so we know what his routine is? So was what you told the police inaccurate? It could have been. But at that point, I was screaming in my brain, Dan is dead, Dan is dead. And if I was inaccurate, it was not to mislead them. You remember going into quite a bit of detail with the detectives, even regarding Dan's uh, accident the prior week when he cut his hand? I could have, yes. Heard that on the tape, though? Uh-huh. <coughs> You've seen the video, heard the testimony. You would agree that the critical moments that you've been asked about, your responses has been you don't remember. Critical moments that I have been asked about, my response I don't remember is the most accurate thing I can tell you. Right, but at the critical moments that you were there in the area, at the same time, that someone happens to be shooting your husband within a six minute window with the exact type of gun that you own and is now mysteriously missing.
That's your version of what happened. That is not my version. The only thing I know for sure is I did not kill Dan. And I have no problem with that. I know I didn't kill Dan, kill Dan with the gun that was put together, the gun that wasn't put together, or the slide that we can't find. But, you know, when your husband dies, everything around you grinds to a halt. And what I told the police, the police said, this is a death notification. But it wasn't a death notification. It was an in-depth interview, as seen <clears throat> by the fact you're bringing up every moment of it as we're coming back. And a death notification, they would have said, we can see you're upset. Let us schedule an appointment. Let us come back and see you this afternoon. Let us do something different. Instead, they hammered away with, at me with questions. Hammer, hammer, hammer. And I can tell you this. I tried to help them the absolute best I could. I tried to give them what I knew was his routine. I tried to help them in any way I could. And the fact that you have managed to construct a case against me out of that is you've constructed a case. But I think your case is held together with real, frankly, Band-Aids. You know. Anything else you want to add to that? No, I think I'm done. Probably more than I want to be. Isn't it possible with your memory problems in the morning that you actually went into the building and shot your husband, and you just don't remember? No, it is not. No, it is not. Because the one thing I knew I had a strong thing is the last time I saw Dan. I see Dan every day. I talk to him every day. This is not a man I would have shot because I had a memory issue. It seems to me like if I had shot him, I would know every detail. You know, I could have told you all sorts of things that was true. I did not shoot my husband, and... I don't know even how to defend myself against the truth, you know. We've talked a lot about Dan. Mm -hmm. We've talked about the devastation to his family. Yes. To the community. And you've seen the devastation in person, right, multiple times, over and over. All the people reaching out to you, the memorials, and the testimony in court. Yes. You would agree that up until the time that you took the stand, you you didn't really show a lot of emotion in this in this trial. No, I wouldn't agree with that at all. The fact that I didn't cry doesn't mean that I didn't show emotion or that I didn't have emotion. It's mean I didn't do the overt thing. What I would tell you is it wouldn't have mattered if I'd cried or not. Because if I had cried, you would be sitting here saying to me, do you agree that you were overly dramatic? So I don't think there's a win-win in this conversation for me. You chose to take the stand. I chose to take the stand. Explain your side of the story. Tell my side of the story. Which I might point out, I have been absolutely quiet about from the day Dan died to now. I have not had press interviews. I have not done any of the things that uh, where I could have told my story early. Okay. When I talk about emotion or lack thereof while you're sitting over there at council table listening to testimony, you agree that you, you actually laughed on quite a few occasions. Is that right? The fact that when I think about Dan, it still gives me joy. I do laugh. I love people who come up and say to me, and I've had several people who've said this in the last few years, Dan was my teacher. I loved him. And I said, tell me stories about him because that gives me joy. You know, yes, I find that, it, you know, am I broken hearted? I'm broken hearted. Am I delighted to hear stories from people who loved him as much as I did? Yeah, I am. Hearing those stories make you emotional as well. Talking about Dan, period, makes me emotional. But a lot of the people who tried, who came up and cried, well, they weren't crying for Dan. They were crying for themselves. I had a horrible experience happen to me. I'm crying. And I am empathetic to that. But when Karen Brophy teared up, my heart broke because I knew she loved him as much as I did. And I knew that she was crying for Dan, not for some other reason. What about the students that, that knew Dan and, and loved him? The students. The students that knew Dan and loved him didn't testify earlier. Who testified a lot of earlier was the instructor, 
two or three of the people who had been in the pastry class. And I am grateful to them for the fact they did what they could do. Do not misunderstand me. But I don't think it changed their life. They went back to school the next weekend. They graduated from the program. They weren't testifying they had to have counseling as a result of this. I'm saying the people whose heart were broken, the people who missed Dan and loved him the most, the people who loved him the most, I, I cry with them because we know. Sorry, did you just testify and say that the person who literally tried to save his life was not negatively affected by this? No, I said she went on with her life, that she didn't, I did not say that. She had a horrible experience. I said I was empathetic to that experience. Uh, but I also know that she wasn't crying that day in court because of that. She was crying because she had had a terrible experience and it affected her with bad memories, but it did not stop her life. Her life went on. Her life, she went back to school. She graduated with the program. You know, it stopped my life. It stopped the Brophy's life. There were students he had whose life had stopped and, and coworkers he had who were truly, truly brokenhearted. Ms. Brophy, did you listen to the testimony of Clarinda Perez? I did, and I've heard it three times now. The first time she told me, I cried because she told me in person. Every time she's been on the stand, Clarinda Perez has sobbed and sobbed and I am sympathetic every time she does it. I know she went through a terrible experience, but she's not crying for Dan. She's crying for the terrible experience she had. You mentioned that. I'm asking about your feelings. Okay. What? What? Let me you, ask the question again, please. You You listened to Clarinda Perez uh -huh. testify about her experience. Right. Now she saw Dan on the ground. She knew CPR. She took it upon herself to try to save his life. Yes. And failed. Yes. She felt that. Yes. You uh, saw her tell that story uh -huh. on the stand. Uh huh. I was absolutely devastated about that experience. No, I disagree with you entirely on that. I think she had a terrible experience. I think that it was a bone jarring experience for her. I think she did everything she could and she was proud of the fact and I was proud for her that she did everything she could. But when she's crying five years after the fact because it was a terrible experience, I think she's crying for the fact she had a horrible experience, not for the fact that Dan Brophy, a man she barely knew, died. Keep mentioning that. We're going to play what's uh, marked as State's Exhibit 116. Yes. <clears throat> I'll play just real briefly and have you identify the voice. So far, they haven't covered anything. Awesome. What does that sound like? Well, I'm also looking where it says call to Sarah, Sarah Gitchell, so I'm assuming that's Sarah Gitchell. Who's the voice that you hear? Yes, that's my voice. That's your voice? Yes. And this is a phone call that you made to Sarah Gitchell? Could be, yes. That's what it says. Okay. Why don't we go ahead and go back to the beginning? Play that. So far, they haven't covered anything that we didn't know. I mean, they had all these little girls who cried today. Uh, you know, and I've seen all these little girls. Well, I've seen particularly the uh, uh, Spanish girl cry two times now. So, you know, she cry talk to you. Uh, Didn't I just say essentially that? That's your response after hearing these people testify to their experience. That's what you thought about that? I thought it was interesting that Corinda Perez, when she told me, did not cry. When she's on the t stand, she cries and she sobs and she carries on. I think she has, uh, I think she had a terrible, terrible experience. That I totally, totally agree with. And I am sympathetic to that. But I also think she can cry on cue when she gets on stand. Uh, because she didn't cry when she told me. 
she told me and I cried, you know, when we went to an event that she came up and said, I am the person who did CPR. And I immediately burst into tears, you know, and she told me the story. And I told her how wonderful I thought she was, you know, that she had done that. But You seem to be a couple steps ahead of me throughout this. Are you expecting this? I don't know if expecting that is what I would say. But I'm sorry, I'll try and uh, be quieter. When you you keep saying Clunder Perez over and over and you keep mentioning her name, in this audio, you don't actually say Clarinda Perez. Okay. Is she the one you're referring to when you say the Spanish girl? I think she is. I don't think the others were Spanish, but they could have been. Okay. And isn't it, did you see Clarinda Perez at the farm yard? I, that, I, I'm sorry about the name, but the farm yard memorial uh -huh. in August? That's where she told me. Okay. Isn't it true that when she came up to you and tried to talk to you, you actually ignored her? No, it's not. Dr. Warford uh, testified and called you a problem solver. Would you agree with that? I think on my feet, yes. It's true. You're not a lawyer, right? No. You got a lot of lawyers in your family. True. Including uh, some of them that practice criminal defense. Yes. <laughs> Ms. Brophy, do you know where I can go in the uh, metro area to rent night vision goggles? I have no idea. You know if there's a place I can go where I can just try them out, handle them? I have no idea. But you bought a pair. I had a person who worked for me who took a loan from me, and that was what he used for collateral. He paid the loan back, he got night vision goggles back. Sorry, the line of questioning with your lawyer was things that you had purchased in order to further your writing. <coughs> Could have, yes, I can see that, but, but in a way, I purchased it. If he had not come back and reclaimed it, uh, they would have been mine. Okay. We heard from a few of your writer friends that are quite successful, uh -huh. lots of published books and make a decent living. Uh -huh. um, that's not true for you though, right? Uh, no, I, I started, most of those people started being published about five years earlier than I did. And uh, I have not been successful. I have had, uh, I have sold books, but I have not sold enough books to make me break out and have people say, hey, this is an author I remember. But considering that with the advent of Amazon, that 10,000 uh, books get published every month, it's now harder to do that than it's been in the past. Right. And you're actually a self-published author. I am. Correct? Have you ever been published besides yourself? Yes, I have. What book was that? It was a book called uh, Sex in the Office. It was published by um, Black Lace Publishing, and it was part of an anthology. When was that? Uh, 2005, maybe 2006, somewhere in there. Not much success after that? Uh, I would say publishing changed, and uh, 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 I wouldn't say, I would say it differently. I would say I didn't get into romance writers with the idea that uh, of being published. That was never my goal. My goal was to write because I like to write. Friends like Sir Lute said, no, you need to write toward getting published. And we were friends long enough that I wrote toward getting published. When did you start writing? I can't remember a time I haven't written. Whole life? Whole life. And when we talk about being published, there's been some questions to you about this witch's book or witch's uh -huh. trilogy that you wrote um, in this email that you got. Uh -huh. That was from a publisher? That was from an edit, uh, a, um, agent. An agent. Uh -huh. So not a publisher. That's right. It was an agent asking to see more of the writing so they could determine whether they were going to be interested in, in purchasing it, correct? That's true. Nobody no, asked. no, no. They weren't per No. An agent uh, acts as your go-between. A lot of editors won't look at your work without an agent. 
So nobody was actually telling you they were buying that book? Nobody was telling me that, no. How many people do you think you sent that manuscript to? I didn't send the manuscript to many people, but I queried a lot of people. You didn't send that manuscript to? It, at best, I sent a chapter. Editors, sure. ed uh, agents <laughs> don't want to have you send their manuscript unrequested. You send a little bit of the writing, they look at it and say, yes, we're interested in this story. No, we're not. I, I'm not an author, so I don't necessarily, I might be using the wrong terminology, so feel free to okay. correct me. You sent a sample, a, p a piece right. of the story. To how many people do you think? Oh, oh, I probably sent it out to uh, 10 to 20. And you got rejected from all of them. Yes. You got this one email about somebody who may be interested. Right. You didn't respond to that email. Yes, I did. Where's that? Uh, I sent them the manuscript. Where's that? What do you mean, where is it? it went magically by uh, email to her. I, a few months later, if you look down the road, you'll see that uh, she sent me a rejection letter. And I would guess, based upon what I know about this, that it would take her 90 days to do that. Testified yesterday that you didn't know anything about guns. So you had to do some research. That's true. And that began in 2017? Uh, that began with this particular story in 2017. Right. But you actually know quite a bit about guns before that, right? I wrote heroes that operated with guns. But where I would get into trouble, because I didn't write in depth about guns, like, for example, in 2015, uh, I did a lot of research on dirty bombs and on uh, plastic explosives like C4. And so uh, so you research what you need. I hadn't really needed, I could pass guns off in by throwing out equipment, uh, equipment stuff. I could talk about flashbangs and I could talk about this. So it sounded like my guys were in that. You know, romance writers don't need a technical description. I'm not Tom Clancy. What they need is a uh, enough believable things that they can get by. Now, when you're writing a book about guns and putting it together, you need information about guns. But for the most part, and in that book, I needed information about how C4 worked and what a string of pearls were and uh, um, things like that. I needed information. I've researched Navy SEALs because several of my hero heroes were leaving the military and they had been Navy SEALs. You right. Know? But when you say thanks to the police, like, oh, the shooter thingy, I mean, you have more knowledge than that. I have more knowledge than that, but the sugar, shooter thingy is when your husband has just died and your words are leaving you. The shoot, I would have said the shooter thingy when I was stressed. You know, I talk to myself in that video. I say, Nancy, this, this, this. I don't talk to myself in third person. I haven't gone over the bend that far. And yet I listen to myself in that thing and I think, whoa, you, I was stressed as hell that I'm talking to myself in third person. Two thousand fifteen you wrote and self published a book called The Wrong Husband, correct? I did. On page two thirty one of that book, it says Austin counted to twenty five slid out from his hiding place and fired six shots into the body on the bed. At the seventh squeeze of the trigger, the gun clicked. No more bullets. Okay. Does that sound right? Yes. You wrote that? Yes. In 2015, also, I'm sorry, in 2017, you wrote a, and self-published a book called The Wrong Seal? Yes. On page 178 of that book, it says, slowly she eased the gun out of her pocket and propped the barrel on the branch. Each shot had to count. Does that sound right? That sounds right. Something you wrote? Yes, but you notice none of that required any in-depth knowledge. In January 2015, you self-published a book called Hell on the Heart. I did. On page 4064, it says, The gun fired. The force of the projectile entering her body rocketed her backward. Call that? I'm pretty sure there was not 4,000 words in that book. 4,000 pa pages maybe, in that book. I'm sorry. <laughs> I might have the page numbers wrong. I'm sure you're right. Uh, I don't think you wrote... Uh, that lengthy of a book. Um, 
Also in that book, he wrote, instead, a darkened window descended and the barrel of a gun sparkled in the sunlight and the shot was loud. Does that sound right? Could be. Later on in that book, you actually talk about a Glock specifically. You say, Dare emerged, his Glock in his hands, but pointed toward the ground. Does that sound right? Yes. And I, as long as we're on that, you ask or somebody Let me ask. ask the question. Sorry. Also in that book, you talk about a Glock again. Mm -hmm. Instinctively, John counted each shot while pulling his Glock free of his shoulder holster. Mm -hmm. okay. You wrote all that. Mm -hmm. Okay. As a writer, is it true that you spend a lot of time thinking about murder? Oh, yeah. When you're romantic suspense, somebody's dying. You also consequently uh, think about police procedure quite a bit. Is that right? Yes and no. I mean, I have wrote that, and I know what you're quoting me on. But uh, I think less about police procedure and more about uh, because – with the exception of only one book, do I really talk about police? Most of the, uh, most of my stories are frankly about the same thing, but, uh, uh, but police procedure is not, I don't go through it step by step. The only book that I have about cops is the wrong cop. Right. It wasn't necessarily talking about what you were writing about, talking oh. about well, your I think thoughts. That, I know, I don't think a ton about police procedure. You know, uh, uh, for one thing, I would have known more if I was paying attention in this uh, case. This case has taught me a lot that I will never be able to use again. But it has taught me a lot about police procedure I had no idea about. You've obtained books regarding police procedures, is that right? I have research books on uh, any number of things. But police procedure, I don't really think would be the thing. I've attended classes where they talked about police procedure. Right. You took that class with uh, Ms. Smith out in Clacken or, I'm sorry, Washington County? They didn't talk about police procedure then. I mean, there may have been some references to it, but they talked about what does the sheriff's county do and what does each department do and how are they working within the community. It was, it was an interesting class. It taught me a lot of things, but it was – more, it was for the benefit of the Washington County public relations, you know, that shows we are working in a different way than you think we're working. And it was very effective because I was dazzled by some of the things that they said. And as a romance writer and thinking about murder and police procedure, you also consider what motives people might have. Is that correct? Yes, because I don't think people <laughs> murder willy nilly unless you're a professional hitman. I think lots of people who say things like, uh, I would never murder anybody. And I say, it's between you and your child. It's him or it's your child. What would you do? And I would bet money that that's all of a sudden their ideas of I would never murder anybody might radically change. Would you agree that financial reasons is a big reason people might murder? Yes, but I don't ever write about that. I mean, I think financial is a big reason. And uh, do you agree that divorce is expensive and, and may not result in you getting anything or much? Divorce is expensive. I don't think that is a mystery to anybody here. But I don't think that uh, it might result in you not getting anything. Uh, you know, real frankly, I suspect that you will get half of what you have, you know. Sure. And as a romance writer and thinking about these things, um, you, you know that people might consider using guns or knives or, or poison to commit a murder. Is that right? Weapons, yeah. And you also would, if somebody were to ask you, you advise against them of considering a hitman because you're bringing somebody else into your, your – How many lifetime stories have we seen where the girl ha hires a hitman to kill her husband, and lo and behold, the hitman turns out to be an FBI agent? Woohoo! You know, I think that's uh, a stopped-on theme. You actually find it easier to, to wish people dead instead of actually killing them, correct? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's so much easier to say <sighs> than to actually do anything because by the time you're over being annoyed at them, you're over being, thinking they, uh, you know, need to have bodily harm. My last question to you, Ms. Brophy, is if there was one thing that you 
know about murder? Is it that anyone is capable of doing it? I absolutely believe that. And I believe that because, once again, if it's your child or the person in front of you, 10 to 1, you will find yourself capable of murder. I think most people don't murder for flimsy reasons. I think people get pushed into a corner where they have no other options. I think people murder because they're protecting somebody they love. I think people murder, well, there's some mercy killings perhaps where people murder to save the person they love pain, but I think that's rare. I think people murder in rage. I don't think people murder because they say, well, you know, we'll just sneak down and uh, do this quickly, you know. I think if you're going to murder somebody, 10 to 1, that person knows that you are not happy with them. You know, I don't think that should come as a mystery, you know, to anybody. I don't think people murder willy-nilly out of the, uh, just because, you know. Yeah, financial reason is a big reason. But going back to my case, there's not enough financial reason there to make it. I do better with Dan alive financially than I do with Dan dead. There's no financial gain here. You know, we had solved our problem. I turned a book into an editor and I said, well, they had a problem here in October of 2017, but they had solved it. But then she murdered him in 2018 when they had solved their financial problem. Where is the motivation, I would ask you? You know, an editor would laugh and say, I think you need to work harder on this story. You have kind of a big hole in it. You know, I think people murder out of anger more than anything else. All right, then I'm going to ask everyone to stop there. It's now noon. We'll take our lunch break and be back at 1.30. Okay, all right.